Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. And uh, very well, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm Hasfira. I'm from uh, the Legal Advisor Office. Today I'm going to talk about uh, research ethics and research ethics committee. As you all know, this is an online uh, IPSIS induction course. Uh, so unprecedented, uh, primarily because of the threat of the COVID-19. But life must go on. And so, since you are here, uh, I understand that uh, before me, even though I cannot see you, uh, postgraduate students who are freshies uh, and also those who are in their second year uh, of the uh, study uh, in your PhD and master degree by research. I also understand that um, the audience before me are social sciences and humanities and business and management clusters students which I believe <clears throat> never heard of UITM Research Ethics Committee uh, and also perhaps have no experience with ethics approval application before. Therefore, I'm here. I'm, there are eight subtopics uh, that I'm going to elaborate here. First of all, um, I would like to discuss about uh, what is research ethics. Uh, Research ethics basically are ethical principles that are followed when planning, preparing, uh, conducting, reporting and publishing research comprising of the following key principles. The first one is uh, it's about personal autonomy principles. When, you, or when we conduct research, it is very pertinent for us to have respect for persons and other subjects that are involved uh, with our research. It follows that we have to give them informed consent about what lies ahead when they participate in the, participate in the research. That is the first one. The second key ethical principle is about non-maleficent principle. Uh, it means that researchers must not do harm to any research subjects. And if possible, they must promote the welfare of research subjects above all. And in doing so, they have to follow accepted scientific research principles, uh, particularly not to exploit vulnerable research subjects, such as the disabled, the elderly, or the minority deprived group. The third key ethics principle is about fairness principle. Here, uh, we talk about the need for the researchers to treat the research subjects fairly. It means that, again, the vulnerable populations, as I mentioned earlier, comprising mainly of the minor, uh, minor the children, the disabled, the mentally health uh, person, uh, or the minority deprived group, they should not be exploited for the sake of uh, research. And if uh, there is no necessity to uh, discriminate, then there should be no group uh, should be excluded from research without justification. And the third principle is with regard to uh, the beneficent principle. It means that we have to ensure that the research that we conduct is of good value as well as a good quality. The aim of the research should be towards improving the human well-being, either uh, locally or at international level. And we only conduct research if we believe that the benefit of the research outweigh the risk uh, in conducting the research. If the aims of the research are of no value or the methodology of, methodology of the research is poor, then most probably the research is uh, will not benefit people in the future. So uh, that is basically what is meant by the uh, research ethics. Uh, why is it that research ethics important? It is important firstly because uh, what, by embracing the research ethics principle, it reflects our respect for those human beings 
who participate in our research. It ensures that there is no unreasonable, unsafe or thoughtless demands are to be made by the researchers, uh, which is against uh, the will or the uh, welfare of those uh, who participate in their research. Uh, research ethics is also important because it ensures sufficient knowledge, especially on the risk, on the study procedures, as well as on the background of studies, uh, to be shared uh, by the researchers uh, with the, 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 the participants of the research subject. Uh, over here, transparency is the key uh, in having a good uh, uh, research uh, in, in dealing with the uh, research uh, participant. And the next one is by having research ethics uh, while doing our research, it will impose a common standard uh, in all the above respects with regard to uh, demands, uh, knowledge, and also respect to the research participants. Uh, Finally, the research ethics also fulfill the norm uh, and expectation for research activity. The researchers who um, fulfill uh, the norm of research uh, activity will uh, eventually comply with uh, various requirements with regard to access to information uh, um, and also with regard to funding and also to publish research. If there is non-compliance with the research ethics requirement, more likely that it is very difficult for the researchers to obtain the funding or they may find it difficult to publish their research for they are unable uh, to give a proof that their research has been conducted in accordance to common standards and norms. So when we are talking about norms, we are actually talking about the international norms underlying uh, the research ethics. Uh, under the Nuremberg Code 1957, uh, also known as the Research Ethics Principle for Human Exper Experimentation, uh, it is uh, provided that when a researcher or a group of researchers uh, are conducting uh, research, First of all, uh, the voluntary human consent is so essential. It means that you must make sure that the uh, research participants who are human um, voluntarily uh, participate in the research. There should not be any elements of undue influence, coercion uh, or threat uh, against uh, the research participants in order to get them to be involved uh, with our research. The second one is the experimental result should be beneficial to the society. And the third one is the anticipated result should justify the experiment. So any experiment must just justifiable. It means that it must serve a certain scientific or uh, research purposes uh, that, that require the experiment to be conducted. Um, the next one is the international norms require avoidance of unnecessary physical and mental suffering. Um, and the fourth one is no experiment should be conducted if there is a chance of death or disability. Uh, while death or disability uh, cannot be um, accurately uh, anticipated or predicted, but uh, we could anticipate uh, that there could be uh, imminent risk of death or disability from the way we conduct our research, especially if it involves a clinical trial or experimentation. The fourth one is to uh, minimize the risk to the subjects. Uh, it means that uh, we shouldn't put our subjects or research participants to face a risk greater than they normally have to face in their daily life. If that being the case, it is more than minimal risk. The next one is we have to prepare uh, 
uh, the facilities, uh, for example, like the labs uh, or the studio that we want to conduct our research um, in a way that it could protect our subjects. Our facilities uh, must be um, ensured that it is uh, it's not dangerous to the research participants. Uh, and other than that, the experiments must be conducted by qualified persons. If it is a, uh, a, if it's a clinical trial, of course, uh, you have to ensure that uh, all uh, the intervention uh, involving, for example, like withdrawal blood, it must be conducted by a qualified person such as a doctor or nurse. But when we are talking in the context of social science, uh, humanities and business and management, uh, it means that if we were to conduct an interview, for example, or focus group discussion, the person uh, who conduct the interview uh, must be properly trained. If they are our research assistants, uh, the researchers must take the responsibility to train uh, their uh, research assistants before uh, sending them to do field work, to do the field work. And the next international norms uh, concerning uh, research ethics is that subjects or research participants are entitled to withdraw any time as they like. Um, it doesn't matter uh, if they want to withdraw it halfway or uh, to even towards the end, uh, we have to respect their wish to withdraw. Uh, because there shouldn't be any element of uh, coercion or uh, unnecessary uh, compulsion uh, on the subjects. Even though that also means we have sometimes need to find other subjects to replace the subjects that have withdrawn. And finally, but of course uh, it rarely happened in uh, social science research such as under uh, social science humanities and business and management. If there is any real uh, threat of uh, injury, disability or death, so the international norms dictate that the experiment or the research must be terminated with immediate effect. So those are basically the research ethics principle for human experimentation. While it is for human experimentation, Elements of this research ethics principle can be adapted uh, for social science and humanities and business and management research as well. Another, another reason why uh, it is important for us to have um, the approval of research ethics committee is because of the research funder requirements. The research funder requirement in Malaysia as it stands now is require, require active approval when applying for a national grant involving human and animal subjects. So ethics approval should be obtained within six months of grant approval. If you check the latest uh, FRGS and also TRGS grant uh, requirement, you could see that the applicants are encouraged to apply for ethics approval even before they apply the, for the grant. So it means that by the time they apply for the grant, they have evidence that research ethics uh, approval have been obtained. But of course, uh, if it cannot be done, uh, ethics approval should be obtained within six months of grant approval. So uh, either way, whether you apply before or after the grant approval, uh, the REC or Research Ethics Committee approval must be submitted together with the first progress report uh, uh, if applicable. So that is basically uh, the national grant uh, research funders requirement in Malaysia. Uh, at institutional level, at UITM uh, level in particular, uh, our UITM research management guidelines uh, require the uh, researcher to apply and obtain for uh, the research ethics committee before approval before they conduct any data collection or, or any research in particular. So it means that uh, there are requirement goals at national and also at institutional level. 
and with the recent uh, circular by the uh, by UITM uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor in Academic uh, and Internationalization, the requirement for REC uh, approval has been extended not only to include PhD and master's student but also uh, final year project paper. So it means that the requirement of research ethics approval have been intensified and broadened uh, in, in, in scope and coverage. So other than that, it is very essential for you, uh, especially as a PhD or master student, who under current uh, IPSIS policy must publish at least in two uh, uh, index, corpus index uh, or WOS index uh, publication uh, to obtain uh, research ethics committee approval. Uh, this is because uh, some of the prominent uh, corpus index and or WOS or uh, publishers, they require for uh, ethics approval to be obtained uh, as one of the precondition before they uh, publish uh, one's research paper or one's uh, journal article. Uh, to cite several examples, Taylor and uh, Francis uh, publishing uh, ethic, ethics policy require the author to be able to provide documented granted ethics approval from an appropriate uh, research ethics committee. So it means that you have to actually submit uh, the REC approval together uh, with your uh, manuscript. The second one is related. Uh, require an author to be able to provide documented uh, uh, granted ethics approval from an appropriate uh, research ethics committee. Similarly, uh, Australian Journal of Social Sciences also require uh, the author to state that ethical approval has been received and discuss uh, any ethical concerns that arose uh, during the research. And uh, another Australian uh, publisher Australian National University Press require author to state that appropriate uh, ethics approval has been received and this uh, approval can come from the author's institution, country or organization and must be able to be provided to publisher for records. So based on this example, uh, it is uh, obvious that uh, for us to publish in reputable journal such as Taylor and Francis publishing uh, and other Scopus index journals or WOS index journal, we uh, unavoidably must uh, give evidence of uh, REC approval. Okay, <coughs> next uh, I would like to discuss uh, uh, and about what are the research projects that require uh, ethics approval? There are four categories of research projects that require ethics approval. The first one is a research project that involves human participants. So it requires ethics approval either as a minimal risk or more than minimal risk uh, application. The second one is it also requires ethics approval if the the research involves animal as a subject. But uh, I have to inform you that when it comes to REC UITM, uh, the uh, term of reference for UITM REC does not include animal participants uh, or animal subjects. Uh, when it involves uh, animal subjects, there is another committee that the researcher has to uh, uh, submit the application to. It is known as uh, UITM CAD. The third one is uh, research projects that require ethics approval also include uh, a situation where the researcher use uh, or exploiting human products or human biological samples in particular. For example, uh, hair, nail, uh, urine, sweat, saliva, mucus, skin cell, or even sperm, uh, uh, if there is a need to. And uh, the last one is uh, research ethics uh, approval is required for a research project 
that have a potential adverse effects on the participants. Uh, for example, it may cause embarrassment, it may cause emotional stress. Uh, when it comes to social science and humanities and business and management research, uh, examples of uh, situation where uh, your research may cause embarrassment or emotional stress is when you as a researcher in your survey form or your interview during interview ask question about someone's private life, someone's dark history, or someone's uh, sexual orientation, or uh, someone's uh, sexual prowess, for example, things like that, that may uh, embarrass them or, or, or put them uh, on emotional stress. Uh, other example, if we were asking our participants about um, their set um, uh, history, you know, involving uh, parents' deaths so or why did they become disabled, things like that uh, may also cause uh, psychological and emotional disturbance. Uh, under such situation, uh, ethics approval is required and normally is more than minimal risk. <coughs> So uh, the next slide, we talk about when and where to apply for ethics approval. Uh, uh, there are there are three uh, situations, a uh, three time frame where we can apply uh, ethics approval. The first one is even before the commencement of any research, uh, disease or dissertation project that requires ethics approval. Uh, in uh, the previous instances. Uh, before we apply the FRGS or TRGS grant, we could actually uh, apply for the uh, research ethics approval if we already have uh, a proper and uh, complete data collection plan. The second one is uh, we apply where once research grant is awarded. And if we refer back to the uh, requirement of the Ministry of Education, uh, the, once the research grant is awarded, means that you, uh, the researcher has six months uh, to apply for ethics approval. So the time frame is six months from the day the grant is awarded. And uh, uh, the third one is uh, we can apply the re research ethics approval while preparing the research proposal. As to where to apply the ethics approval, of course, if we are UITM researchers, then uh, we are encouraged, not only encouraged, we are required to submit our proposal to the UITM Research uh, Ethics Committee uh, through the Secretariat uh, at the Research Management Committee. Um, but uh, we have to bear in mind, uh, besides UITM Research Ethics Committee, uh, there are 12 other accredited uh, REC's uh, in Malaysia. So, uh, if we include UITM, there will be 13 accredited RECs in Malaysia. So, uh, if our studies involve uh, collecting data, not only uh, from UITM or at UITM, uh, but uh, at other places, for example, in hospitals or in school, uh, we need to, the researchers need to apply for IT approval from the research ethics committee of that respective institutions. So, uh, having said that, researchers who are not from UITM but intend to conduct study in UITM are also required to submit their proposals to the Secretariat. Uh, whereas non-UITM researcher is required to obtain ethics approval from their institution prior to submission to UITM. It means that if they, 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 uh, the researcher is not from UITM, they come uh, and submit, we will ask them whether they have already submitted uh, are is, uh, pro and uh, get the approval from their uh, own REC, if there is any. So, for studies involving uh, Ministry of Health Science, for example, public hospitals around Malaysia, researchers have to submit their research proposal to the medical research and ethics committee or MIREC after uh, internal uh, REC approval. So um, those are actually um, uh, places where we can apply for uh, REC approval beside from UITM. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, 
UITM Research Ethics Committee uh, specifically. So this REC uh, was established and approved by the Vice Chancellor of UITM in 2004. So uh, since its establishment, it has been registered uh, with the Drug Control Authority of the National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Agency of the Ministry of Health. Uh, so it is a registered REC. So in terms of governance, REC currently is positioned at tier 2, uh, which is quite high, um, uh, is uh, in research and uh, uh, innovation governance. So it means that it reports directly to uh, the Jautang Kuasa Induk Pendidikan University, also known as JKPU, and uh, UITM Senate. So in terms of management, uh, at present, the Research Ethics Committee is governed by the Research Management Center and chaired by the uh, Yang Berusaha Professor Dr. Nur Ashiki Muhammad Nur Khan, since 1st November of 2019. And uh, the REC holds its uh, monthly meetings uh, for uh, REC approval uh, every third Tuesday every month. And this meeting schedule can actually be viewed at REC website. If you, if you uh, type UITM REC uh, and on the, uh, in the Google search uh, uh, web, Side, then you may you will find uh, the meeting schedule uh, in that website. So <clears throat> the objective of the establishment of RECs, just like any other REC in Malaysia, first it was established in order to examine ethical issues in research proposals. Uh, the second one is it uh, is established to ensure that research projects conducted at UITM are in compliance with the good clinical practice guideline of the Ministry of Health of Malaysia as well as the Malaysia and the declaration of Helsinki uh, World Medical Association uh, WNA. So uh, another objective of the formation of the REC is to ensure that no intentional harm is or will be inflicted on the subjects. So the REC in this sense will uh, stand as a gatekeeper to um, ensure that the welfare of the research participant or research subjects are well looked after. The next one is uh, the REC objective also <coughs> aim at protecting the rights and well-being of human subjects. And we all know human subjects, uh, they have their own fundamental rights and liberties as a human being. And uh, this is particularly and equally um, applicable when it comes to uh, research participants uh, who are involved or, or volunteered in our research. Their rights must be protected. And finally, the REC objective is the, to protect the rights of the researchers and the UST. Well, we talk so much about the rights of the research participants, we should also bear in mind of the rights of the researchers and the UST. We, when we uh, evaluate the research the committee evaluate, <coughs> Um, the uh, uh, research methodology and the procedures of data collection. We also, apart from taking into account the welfare of research participants, also look into the possibility if the method is dangerous to the researchers as well. And there is also uh, another area that we like to look, whether or not uh, the research conducted will jeopardize the image and reputation as well as goodwill of the university if the goodwill and reputation of UITM is at stake because of this research, there is um, an inclination or the, the, the practice is not to allow for such data collection or such research to take place. Okay, uh, in terms of membership, uh, all uh, members of the REC are appointed uh, by the Vice Chancellor of UITM. And uh, all internal members of REC, um, uh, either prior or after their appointment, will attend and sit for the Malaysian Code of Responsible Conduct and Research Certification Program, and they, they must pass it 
in order to become a qualified REC member. And uh, majority of internal members uh, are also uh, certified uh, by, uh, are also GCP certified, Good Clinical Practice certified. Um, and in terms of uh, the composition of uh, REC membership, <coughs> uh, uh, the requirement is for there to be at least five members of REC's uh, and must comprise of both men and women, uh, even though may, they may not be equal in number because they are numbers, but they must have the representation from both genders. And uh, in terms of the uh, hierarchy, uh, REC is headed by a chairman, uh, I mentioned this now, current chairman is Professor Dr. Noachikin. <coughs> uh, and uh, we also have uh, appointed the deputy chairman, Professor Madia Dr. S uh, Datin Dr. Sarina. Uh, even though it's not in the constitution, but it's conventional for us to have a deputy. The second, the next is for us to have a member with knowledge of current and current um, of and current practice experience in the professional care, counseling or treatment of people. That means uh, we uh, norm we will invite either the medical practitioners or uh, health uh, care uh, provide uh, practitioners uh, or pharmacists uh, or, 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 or academics from uh, allied health sciences to become uh, our members. Uh, and another category of member is. Uh, member with knowledge of and current areas in the areas of research that are regularly considered by the REC. Uh, based on the current statistic, uh, uh, the application for research ethics committee, uh, uh, especially from the social sciences and mainstream information, uh, normally come from uh, the uh, sports uh, and uh, sciences, uh, from the um, uh, education and, uh, and from uh, the uh, policy and law studies. So, uh, in, uh, another uh, category of member is uh, lay persons. Uh, we, uh, the REC need to have two members of lay person uh, in order to actually, you know, being inclusive so that uh, this uh, REC committee is not only uh, being uh, or, or comprised of uh, academics but must also comprise of outsiders and uh, in order to get um, um, input uh, with regard to spiritual or religious issue so a member from a religious institution or person who performs similar role in community is also made um, as a uh, a member of the REC and finally a lawyer uh, also uh, we become a member of uh, REC uh, in the sense um, at the moment uh, I am uh, the REC member under this category <coughs> uh, okay uh, next we look at categories of ethics uh, approval applications uh, there are two types or two categories of ethic approval. The first one is minimal research uh, ethics uh, approval applications. And the second one is more than minimal research ethics approval application. As for the former, as for the former, So, uh, as for the minimal risk research, uh, we categorize a research as a minimal risk research when the probability and magnitude of possible harms implied by participation, participation in the research is no greater than those encountered by participants in uh, everyday life. Um, so, uh, another uh, type of uh, research that will be considered as minimal research is with, when the studies involve uh, only anonymous data. It means the data which cannot be linked 
uh, or trace uh, to the research participants. It means it has been anonymized and it has been redacted. Uh, the next uh, 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 types of research, uh, when, when the research is uh, uh, considered as a minimal research, it will be reviewed by the REC member. But before that, it must be presented by the applicant at faculty or state campus. Uh, and uh, once the faculty or state campus research committee has approved uh, the research, then only they will submit it to the REC and the reviewer will decide whether or not the research meets the minimal risk requirement. If the reviewer, who are actually members of the REC, uh, decide that the research is actually more than minimal, minimal risk, then uh, the review process will be conducted before a full board of the REC. So it must be presented to the REC. Uh, this, this, the second type of uh, minimal risk research is what is known as a more than uh, minimal risk research. So in the more min than minimal risk research, <clears throat> the probability and magnitude of possible harms implied by participation in the research is greater than those uh, encountered in uh, everyday life. It means that um, if the, for example, like if the research require the uh, participants to do something that is dangerous, something that the researchers, uh, the, so, so, sorry, the, the human participant will not do in their daily life, then it will be considered as more than minimal risk. So if the research involves subjects uh, that are within a spectrum of society that need special support. For example, a disabled person or a mentally health person or uh, um, challenged person or mentally challenged person, then, then it will be also required uh, to be submitted before the full board because it's more than minimal risk. So re any research which is carried out in an unstable or volatile setting is also considered as a more than minimal risk research. Uh, besides that, um, research that involves novel, unconventional, non-standard methodologies or approaches, something that new, that never heard before, that never be done. So, and if it is uh, risky to the research participant, then also will be considered as more than minimal risk. Uh, if the research presents risk to the personal safety of the researcher or the research participant beyond what is normal in the setting. That also be considered as minimal risk. Even though I have to caveat that when it comes to social science research uh, conducted by the researchers in social science, community science, business and management, um, there are really situations where uh, this kind of more than minimal risk research uh, situation uh, exists and occur. And the last one is the research will be considered as more than minimal risk if the conduct or outcome of the research may be distressing to the researcher or research participant in one more way or another. So <clears throat> if regardless of whether it is a minimal risk or more than minimal risk, um, when uh, the research involves research uh, part human participants, then the researcher will be required uh, to uh, submit uh, research uh, ethics uh, application uh, to the REC. And uh, as you can see in the slides, uh, there are uh, nine. Uh, there are several types of uh, REC forms. Uh, the first one is REC1. The REC1 is merely a flowchart. Uh, it shows uh, how the uh, research ethic approval uh, is uh, processed, you know, from the day the re researcher through the faculty or the branch campuses submit their ethics approval application up to the decision is made uh, whether uh, the ethics is, uh, application is approved or not. <clears throat> but 
The second one is REC2, is the form where everyone has to fill in. It is known as REC2 form. Uh, this REC2 form is actually uh, comprised of uh, the title of the research, uh, name of researcher, uh, basically what the researcher has to do when they fill up this uh, ethics form is actually to export <coughs> their research proposal into various sections relevant uh, to this uh, 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 to their research for example uh, the part b is about the research details uh, part b2 is about the research background research problem references research objective so uh, since this is an online uh, uh, seminar so uh, i'm not able to show you the sample but I suggest for you to type uh, UITM REC and you may have a look at uh, all these forms. Uh, next to uh, uh, REC2 form is REC3 form. REC3 form is Research Risk Classification form. Uh, in this form, uh, you are, uh, the researcher needs to actually sort of classify and declare uh, whether their research, uh, whether or not their research involve uh, children uh, above or below 18. If uh, your research uh, involve uh, children below 18, and uh, then the guardian or the parental consent must be obtained. Besides that, uh, if the research involve uh, the minority, then uh, then it will be considered as more than minimal risk. So there are like uh, 23 sets of questions uh, that you need to answer on the risk classification form. Of course, we want to see the answer mostly no. If you tick it yes, then it is an indication that the research may be uh, more than minimal risk, then it will be uh, subjected to a presentation before the full board. And the next is REC4. REC4 is subject information sheet where uh, you have to fill in the form in both uh, Bahasa Melayu, Bahasa Malaysia and uh, English language uh, version. Uh, uh, in uh, this uh, REC4 form, uh, again, you have to rewrite your research title introduction. You have to write the purpose of research to declare your research procedure and uh, to inform your research participant of the benefits of uh, uh, participating in the research. Uh, since this subject information sheet uh, is meant for the research participant, so the REC will make sure that the wording used is not uh, so, uh, no, does not use uh, uh, jargon or whatever terms that is not uh, friendly to the layman. And for the introduction of research, uh, you only need to write maximum 300 words and the purpose of research not more than 50 words. That you can actually uh, look in the website. Another uh, form that is uh, applicable for the researchers uh, uh, from the social science or research is the REC5. REC5. REC5 is a checklist for applicants. In fact, not only from the social science uh, clusters, but also from uh, SNT clusters as well. They have to uh, fill in this checklist for applicant form. So this is just to make sure that you, uh, the applicants, uh, do does not uh, leave behind any important documents or important details in the application. Uh, we want to see, as a RC member, we want to see that uh, all columns are ticked as yes, so that we know that. Uh, the documents are in order. <clears throat> so these are basically uh, the forms that uh, these uh, 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 applicants need to uh, fill in. As for once the research uh, ethics application form have been submitted, it will be uh, subjected to review and uh, the designated reviewer from amongst the uh, REC committee member will actually uh, review, take their time to review and it, it, it will not be more than seven days so we have to review it within seven days 
and once we have reviewed we will fin fill in the so-called research ethics application uh, reviewing form so this research ethics uh, reviewing form is actually uh, the reviewers uh, suggestion whether they or not they agree that this research is a minimal risk research if they disagree then they will actually state in the reviewing form that uh, the, the researcher has to actually present uh, the uh, their application before the full board so uh, in this research ethics uh, application reviewing form uh, we will look whether uh, uh, the research method uh, has been uh, rightly described in the research application if it is an interview we want to see whether uh, the interview protocol the interview question have been um, you know uh, constructed in a way that it is suitable for the uh, targeted uh, population and research participant if it is a survey we like to see whether the survey form uh, is actually um, um, uh, prepared in a way that you know it is easy to understand and can be answered uh, within a specific framework uh, and etc if the research involves secondary data analysis we want to see whether the data data have been redacted and uh, confidentiality is preserved it does not link the research participants uh, to any of the uh, it cannot link the the data cannot li be linked to the research participants etc etc and uh, in another section we look uh, who are the subjects of this research if it involves uh, children we want to see whether the parents have given their consent uh, and if it is involved vulnerable people and want, we will make sure that they will not be exploited and more, um, if, if they do uh, they will be subjected to further scrutiny and uh, if not they will be uh, the researcher will be asked to present it before the board and uh, we also would like to see in the section c we would like to see uh, the background of the research is well written, the research problem is well written, and the inclusion and exclusion criteria is included. While it is not common for the social science researchers to have inclusion and exclusion criteria, but when you apply um, this uh, uh, ethics uh, uh, approval from your ITM REC, uh, you have to ensure that uh, you complete the inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, section. Uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria means the criteria that you want to include uh, with regard to uh, your participant. You know, your participant must have certain character or certain uh, qualification, uh, uh, then only you want to include. And uh, if they have certain or they are missing certain traits or certain characteristics, you want to exclude. So that uh, really uh, have to be declared uh, in the inclusion and exclusion criteria section. Besides that, the sample size and statistical analysis must also be well written. Uh, we want to see whether the sample size is uh, in accordance to uh, standard requirement, whether it's too, too low, whether it's too big, the samples, and the statistical analysis whether uh, it is uh, in according to research objective or uh, whether uh, it is it, it is not appropriate for a particular type of uh, sampling so all these are uh, things that we want to see uh, when we review uh, the ethics application once we have review uh, we have reviewed uh, the, the the application and given our decision the decision will be informed by the REC within two weeks uh, after the REC meeting. There are four categories of decision that are made by REC on ethics approval applications. The, it's the idea the application is approved or approved but a conditional approval subject to changes. Or there is another uh, category of approval which is known as you need to present, researcher need to present. And particularly because it is more than minimal risk and the fourth one but rarely never happened uh, so far or if, if does happen we will give time is where the approved the application is not approved 
at all. So, uh, like I said, uh, under current uh, statistic, using current statistic, all uh, application have been approved. But of course, uh, before they get approved, some of them they need to do to do um, major corrections or minor correction and resubmit to the REC for uh, re re reviewing and also uh, uh, consequently being approved. And if it is a minimal risk approval, minimal risk risk uh, research, then uh, and the reviewer will either recommend it to be approved without changes or approved without uh, correction. Uh, like I said just now, if more than minimal risk, it requires uh, the researcher to present before the REC. What happens if <clears throat> your application is uh, rejected? In the event of uh, non-approval, then uh, the applicant has a right to appeal to the REC decisions. And appeal, uh, if it's done from uh, by the undergraduate or postgraduate uh, students undertaking final year project paper, it must be submitted through the supervisor. So appeal must be submitted in writing within two weeks upon issuance of REC letter that outlines the reason for this decision. And uh, once REC uh, receive the uh, appeal, the REC will deliberate and make decision and decision will be final. But that would be very rare. What is more common is in the event of conditional approval, uh, i.e. the approval is subject to amendment. If that being the case, the applicant must submit the duly amended document within 90 days from date of letter of issued by the REC. And they must prepare a cover letter indicating the corrections. REC has been generous enough to provide a cover letter template where the applicant can use. Uh, you can, can search uh, in the website. Since this is online, I cannot show you uh, the cover letter template. And uh, once you prepare the cover letter, you attach the supporting documents if necessary and highlight the corrections in the relevant forms. Once you have the cover letter, the supporting document, and you have already highlighted the correction, please upload the scan amended form to uh, the REC uh, links website. Um, uh, it is in the REC website. So, in the event the amended documents are not submitted within the prescribed period, a fresh application has to be made, uh, which is a waste of time, unless uh, otherwise instructed by the chairman. So, I believe uh, that's all that uh, I can um, um, actually explain to you about uh, research ethics uh, committee and also the process uh, involved in uh, submitting the research uh, ethics application. Uh, since I'm already give, uh, uh, only given like one hour to talk and I feel it's very weird that I talk uh, alone in this room uh, without you uh, before me uh, as normally uh, I did in the lecture hall. Um, <laughs> I wish you all, no matter where you are, uh, all the best in your postgraduate uh, undertakings. Uh, I hope and I pray uh, each and every one of you uh, will uh, graduate on time, GOT, and uh, inshallah, uh, God willing, uh, in three years' time, we will see you in the conv convocation halls at the ATC UITM Shah Alam celebrating uh, your successful completion of the uh, the successful completion of your postgraduate research scan wabilai taufiq wa daya assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh